Well, hey there, Science 10, Mr. Bleeker again. This is going to be lesson 7.3, and in this topic, we're going to cover uh, fusion as compared to fission. So we'll be looking at nuclear reactions and um, looking at how they can cascade out of control, some interesting alternatives such as the thorium reactor. Uh, there's a lot to get to, so I think we better get to it now. So two shakes. Here we go. All right. So... When it comes right down to it, um, this is Science 10, Section 7.3, uh, a very good section. And there was a warning from Albert Einstein, but it's a really good one. And he was warning that, well, you know, it, nuclear power is going to be a great thing in the long term. But at the time, it was a superpower. And when you look at even the uh, comic book characters at the time, the amazing Spider-Man, a radioactively powered uh, human with spider blood. Um, when you look at the Hulk, gamma radiation. It was all about radiation. The, the era was fixated on radiation as a source of power. And um, in the modern era, you see a lot more with genetic engineering and a lot more with DNA. So you can see how the eras have changed. But when you look at atomic energy, uh, Albert Einstein had a very wise warning uh, for the world. Let's back up a little bit and talk about nuclear fission. When we talk about fission, what we're referring to is splitting. And specifically, we're talking about splitting um, larger nuclei into smaller ones. So one second here. The idea is this is your larger nucleus. And then into two smaller nuclei. So, for example, when we look at a typical fusion or fission type device, um, when we look at, unfortunately, what was used in war in the past, we could take something that would split, for example, helium nuclei into hydrogen atoms. And that's, that's an example of what we would refer to as nuclear fission, breaking down something big into something small. Um, it releases an incredible amount of energy. Unfortunately, as you'll see that as we get further into this topic, that nuclear fusion releases far more. So the idea of fission here is that we send a small particle, just enough to push a nucleus over the deep end. And by now in the lessons, I hope that you have a good understanding that if we send a neutron, into an already unstable nucleus, um, really what we're talking about here is a critical mass. And that neutron um, literally bursts that nucleus into smaller nuclei. And that nucleus, as it bursts, releases its own neutrons. And they continue to make connection with other nuclei and it causes other nuclei to essentially pop. So what we're looking at is a fission chain reaction here. And this is sort of a cascading effect as they refer to it. So what you'll have is a big nucleus and this can happen with some of our larger uh, rather unstable elements in the periodic table. And it just takes a little nudge to get them to fall apart. So a little nudge. And the subatomic particles can come flying out. For example, we're looking in this case at neutrons and smaller nuclei. So we've got lots of arrows here. But I think more or less you get the idea that, a, that basically hitting a nucleus with a small amount of subatomic mass, in this case a neutron, is just enough to just push it over the edge to cause it to become unstable and to cause this chain reaction where it essentially falls apart. Here's another way to look at it, right? We've got our neutron here and our target nucleus, and that is just enough to form what we call fission products. And we have one here and we have one here or 
what we refer to as smaller nuclei. But the real thing to keep your eye on is the neutron... Oops. Haha, -ha, look at that. Well, it panicked on me, so one second. Wow, I haven't seen that before. So we'll reopen that again. So one second, folks. My apologies, but it panicked. There we go. And there we are. So, current. Nothing we can't recover from. So the idea, going back now, is that you can not only get smaller nuclei, but you can get neutrons, which can then bump into other nuclei and cause them to become, become unstable. So that can be a major problem. And that's how these reactions get out of control, and we call those um, cascading reactions. Now in this case, if you want to look at the fission chemistry, the way you write a neutron is you write a neutron as having one particle of mass. So this is its mass, and because a neutron isn't really anything in the periodic table, it doesn't get an atomic number. So it's assigned an atomic number of zero, whereas a proton would get an atomic number of one. Because everything in the periodic table, as you start to stack up the protons, you get each element in the periodic table. Now in this case, if we combine a neutron with something like uranium-235, you would look at it and say, okay, maybe it's going to become uranium-236. You would think, okay, it becomes uranium-236 and the atomic number stays 92. But that's not what happens. Because uranium is already so unstable, if you bombard uranium-235, that particular isotope, right, with a neutron, it falls apart. So you say, okay, where does the missing mass go? Well, in this case, uranium-235 splits into smaller chunks. And those chunks aren't exactly the same in size. So when you look at different atomic materials, you more or less have to study the reactions. But if we take a look at the mass, there we go. That was my bad because I just restarted that. If you take a look at the mass, the total mass of the reactants is 236 mass units. Okay. When you take a look at the products, which are krypton and barium, you'll see that some of the mass, some of the 236 mass units is, is accounted for here. In fact, we have 233 mass units. So where's the remaining three units of mass? Well, it's right here. Remember that we said that this goes critical. And in fact, if you throw a neutron at uranium-235, which is depicted here, it will kind of freak out, and you'll get the production of krypton and barium, these smaller particles here, relatively, but you also get three neutrons. So what does this mean? Well, it's kind of almost like a big planet blowing up into little chunks, but some of those chunks are capable of starting other reactions. You've got three neutrons, and this is one here, here, and here. Now think about it. You have neutrons flying off and lots of uranium-235 around. So this causes a cascade reaction. Think of dominoes literally lined up one after the other like this. And you're throwing neutrons at them. Well, it's going to cause a cascading effect. It's not just going to affect this uranium-235. It's going to affect a whole bunch of uranium-235s. 
and you're going to get a serious, serious amount of energy out of this nuclear reaction. And that's what we're looking at here. We're trying to split uranium-235 into smaller chunks, krypton and barium, and we're hoping that as it splits, it gets other uranium to split just to release energy. I know it sounds insidious, but nuclei can fall apart. So sort of let this set in, sort of let absorb this, sort of blowing up atoms, and they blow into smaller chunks, and the neutrons cause other nearby unstable uranium to blow up. And if you see those three neutrons, you can imagine this is just from one impact. Imagine multiple impacts. That's pretty hard to shut down, right? Well, exactly. It's very hard to shut down. Uranium-235, this particular isotope, um, is something that we kind of want to keep under control. We want to have what are called moderators something that can slow down the process, give us a little bit of a, a break, you know, as this reaction is careening out of control. And we have little things that we can get in the way, such as control rods. Um, we don't want this to just be a reaction that we can't control or can reach a critical mass and get away from us. So when you look at nuclear reactions and you look at the public's perception of nuclear reactions, Yes, these things can provide a crazy amount of energy, and it's carbon neutral. There's no, there's no carbon dioxide produced, no greenhouse gases. But you're left with some pretty interesting nuclear chemistry that you had better keep under control. And remember, with the energy that we're producing, what we're trying to do is to heat water with it. If we can heat water, we can run turbines, and if we can run turbines... It's a great way to produce electrical energy. It's a non-carbon based way of doing it. But you look at these chain reactions and you say, yee, what's going on? Okay, focusing in on the bottom, uh, not so much the top. We can talk about the top later. But this reaction down here is the one that we've been more or less uh, talking about till now. So we've got, of course, Oops, we've got our uranium-235, that particular isotope, becoming unstable because uranium-236 really doesn't work. And remember that it's the number of neutrons compared to protons. Literally, take 236 mass units, subtract 92. Okay, remember this is 92 protons. And when we look at how nuclei are held together with sort of that nuclear force, right? Why else would a positively charged nucleus exist? There's got to be something holding the neutrons and the positively charged protons together. So let's do a little math here. 23 minus 9, right? We're looking at 144 neutrons. Okay, let's think about that ratio. We've got 144 neutrons. Wow. I guess you can see this version of, uh, this version of uh, PowerPoint is a little unstable, which is kind of ironic since uh, I'm working on, um, I'm working on uh, PowerPoint. It is their product, but it's okay. I'll get to it. All right, so we were here, so my apologies, but it's really not me. Okay, so we had 144 neutrons, and what we're looking at comparatively was 92, oops, 92 protons. Okay, that is not a healthy ratio. There are way too many neutrons compared to protons, and this thing is going to go kerblooey. And it does, and that's why we get these two fragments and our neutron payload, which is going to cascade this reaction. But we get a lot of energy when things fall apart, which is the whole idea, so we can make power with it. You know, keep your iPhones going. Oh, and those Android phones. Don't worry, we won't forget you. 
looking at the reaction, we can see that it's really, well, with three neutrons, and then it runs into more uranium-235, which we see here, sort of depicted, and we see that things are going to get going. We're going to get a cascading reaction. We're going to get a lot of stuff falling apart. We're going to get more neutrons. And it's like, whoa, what are we going to do? So one of the things you can do is you can sort of run interference with cadmium and you can absorb those neutrons and slow down that reaction. Um, you don't want this to just get going because imagine how much energy is going to be released. More than you know what to do with. And then you've got way more than you can deal with. Not a good thing. So we talk about times where this has happened. Uh, Chernobyl. I was a spry lad. Um, this is 1986. I would have been in grade 10, of all things. And Chernobyl, um, there was a large, to say the least, meltdown in the Soviet Union. It's still radioactive today. And the thing you have to understand about radioactivity is its effect on DNA, okay? Deoxyribonucleic acid. That is the gene of, of, that is the master molecule of all the genes of life. And radiation causes irregularities or errors in the gene uh, patterns. And this is not a place where you want to be. Um, this isn't radiation that just goes away after a generation. This is, this is a radiation that continues generation after generation after generation. And genes that you would expect to be expressed properly are not expressed properly. And you're getting, um, for example, Hox genes. We talk about that a bit in Biology 11. And these are genes that are responsible for your arms and uh, limbs like your arms or your head attaching to your neck. It's literally the master set of genes for where all the parts should come together. And if you mess with that, you get some very irregular uh, patterns in the expression of critters' DNA. And you can see this one poor cow, for example, and, and just the effect it's had on generations. It's very unfortunate. Another thing you have to think about is, as a society and as a human being, is what fission means to war. When you break atoms and you release an incredible amount of energy, that energy can be used for devastating effects. In fact, we use fission now as a trigger for fusion bombs, which is, boy oh boy, um, Fusion bombs make fission bombs look like firecrackers. If you want to think about just how atrocious this is, we dropped um, by we, we talk about um, the United States, um, not that that's Canada, but we in North America, specifically the Americans, dropped a uh, fission bomb, uh, two in fact, and it ended single-handedly, or dual-handedly, ended the Second World War, um, uh, causing Japan just to surrender on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. These are unbelievable, and they involve really unstable elements, uranium and plutonium. The idea of nuclear fission is to cause that extraordinary release of, of energy, and it's, um, yeah, to devastating effects. Nuclear fusion is worse. Nuclear fusion would be when you take two smaller particles, right, and you make Mr. Big, like this. Now, think about the sun, for example. Under intense gravitational effects, you take hydrogen in the sun and fuse it together, two smaller particles, two protons, and fuse it together to form helium. And not only that, but then you have the fusion of not just helium, but helium with helium, hydrogen with helium, and you start fusing together all and forming all sorts of he denser, heavier elements. Um, that's what stars do. Eventually, when they collapse, uh, they collapse when they can't fuse together extremely dense elements. And we get things like gold 
when stars sort of go poof when they're trying to condense the heaviest elements in the universe and they just can't do it until they die and in that last great moment you get some of the most spectacular elements in the universe such as gold which is what makes it so rare but when you do this your energy release is redunculous okay i'll just be silly in my description but nuclear fusion is not something we can do that well under control on the planet. We're working at doing this to fuse smaller nuclei to release a tremendous amount of energy, but we're just not there yet. It's, it was hard enough with fission to do it, but fusion under control conditions? Yeah, no. So looking at fusion, right, for example, in this case, we could look at some small atoms, and in this here, they would be talking about, well, looking at that, uh, we'd be looking at something like hydrogen, isotopes of hydrogen, seeing that positive charge kind of clues you in on it. And these are isotopes because uh, this version of hydrogen here has a single neutron and this one has a couple of extra neutrons. But what we get is a large kind of unstable atom. And remember, when the neutron ratio isn't the same as the protons, um, that's kind of unstable and then we can get that, once it's fused together, it can pop apart as well and release even more energy. Kaboom. When this happens, particles are given off. And you can get a pretty high-speed neutron being released, and that'll go through pretty much anything. Um, when we look at the reaction of hydrogen, um, if you look at hydrogen with an extra neutron, so I'll just draw it in, this particular version is called deuterium and tritium. I always remember tritium because of tri, right? That there's three elements in it. To be hydrogen, you have to have, of course, your proton. And then what are the other two things? What make three? Well, you've got neutron and a neutron here. If you bring together deuterium, right, which is pretty stable, right? It's a one-to-one -one ratio. And if you bring that together with tritium, which isn't the most stable, right? Because you've got an extra neutron here and it's a little bit imbalanced. We get a product, which is kind of like helium. It's like helium with um, three neutrons. It's this particular isotope. And it's not happy. So what it blows up to become is it becomes a stable form of helium where you've got two protons and two neutrons. You get a runaway neutron, right? Probably this guy here, he's making a run for it, right? And you get a crazy amount of energy. So if you want to fuse together something that doesn't have a really happy proton to neutron ratio, let me draw a little sad face like that, um, what happens with these nuclei is they'll fall apart. And when they fall apart, that releases energy. And you can heat water with that, and, right? Charge iPhones and all that crazy stuff. So looking at a fusion reaction of this nature, the way we write it is this would be deuterium. And this would be tritium. I'm being lazy and just writing the first part. You get a stable helium nucleus. So... Let's write, yay, helium. And that helium nucleus is a stable part, but in order to become stable, it threw off a neutron, right? And again, remember the notation, neutron, one atomic mass unit, or sorry, one, one atomic mass unit, no protons, so it gets an atomic number of zero, and there's that energy bonanza that we were looking for. Okay, so I'm sort of getting this. We want to push things together that are then so unstable that they pop and they release energy. Okay, fine. Um, you have to do this under highly controlled react, uh, conditions. Um, and that's the trick, right? Can we keep it under control? Well, if we look at some of the things that we've done, we could, for example, take 
uh, krypton and barium, which we saw in atomic fusion a little while ago. And if we just added those three neutrons, perhaps what we could do is cause a fusion reaction and we could get uranium-236 back and energy. See, that's a trick, right? We were just looking at fission a moment ago with this particular example, but what about fusion? What if we brought together the krypton and the barium and what they need to form uranium-236? Remember that uranium-236, right? If you're gonna fuse it, is it gonna be stable? Is it gonna stay together? Is it going to produce energy, right? You're getting the idea now. So the hydrogen bomb really is requires a fission trigger in order to get the reaction to proceed. Um, you're going to need to put in sort of a, a, I wouldn't like to call it a smaller reaction, but enough of an energetic trigger to get it to go. And we haven't dropped a hydrogen bomb in any scenario, nor would we want to. <laughs> it's, it's, it's literally like causing a piece of the sun to detonate on the earth, but that's not something that we should ever consider doing. Okay, so let's move on to a slightly less, um, less drastic topic. Is this being done in Canada? And you say, well, okay, so are there nuclear reactors in Canada? And the, the answer is yes. Oops, they're called CANDU reactors. So Canadian nuclear reactors, right? Candus. So we do have them. Um, you're seeing a cooling pond here, but you're not quite seeing the guts, so we've got to go a little bit inside. So in a Candu reactor, and sorry for a little bit of the crazy text here, what we're going to do, right, is nudge uranium-235 until it's unstable, and we're going to get it to do fission, We don't do fusion, folks. We, that's not sustainable, at least not at this point. And this is the krypton and the barium and the three neutrons with the energy pattern that we've kind of been referring to. Nice lightning bolt there, Mr. Bleeker. That's somewhat sustainable. Um, we, get a, we get some pretty nasty nuclear waste, um, but... Um, that's a topic for later. Where do you put it? Where do you store it? Because it's got millions of years of half-lives to go through, uh, if not billions, until it's considered to be a safe product. But um, the Candu reactors, they use a, they use a form of, of heavy water, which is kind of interesting here. A little, little annotation. And when you look at heavy water, you think of water as being H2O. So what are they actually heating? Like, you think about H2O, but have you ever thought about what kind of H that is? Right? And they use a form of water, which is the deuterium um, style of hydrogen. And it's a kind of water that makes this reaction just a little bit more sustainable, a little bit more, well, like I said, sustainable. So this reaction's got to be under control because if these neutrons start bumping into all these uranium neighbors, right, we have a problem. We can't let that go unchecked or the amount of energy is too much, right? So for example, you need the cadmium shielding. Um, a major side effect you kind of have to understand a little bit about this is when you're working with uranium the way they're doing it, they're producing plutonium. And plutonium is something that can be used in a lot of nuclear devices. So plutonium itself is just a, to say a little, uh, least uh, bit here, not trying to be facetious, just a tad bit of a concern, right? Um, radioactive processes you have to keep an eye on because what happens as a result of the process, you can get radioactive materials that could be used in nuclear weapons. So not to get into a ton of detail, but um, it's a very strong consideration. So here's the deal. If we're looking at radioactive waste, and we say, okay, what are we going to do with the radioactive materials? For example, 
what happens if you produce um, these various kinds of waste? What happens? And remember, we're just looking at one particular nuclear reaction here, but some of these half-life products, um, Neptunium-237, uh, for example, that's a two million year half-life product. So these radioactive materials you're producing, in order to go through additional processes to become sort of uh, waste products that could eventually be harmless, well, we'll all be dead and gone because it'll take millions of years until they're used up. So the idea of storing them in mountains or can we just fire it into the sun? Well, you really don't want radioactive waste um, in a rocket going above a populace of people in case that rocket itself um, fails and you're raining radioactive material down over people. It's just not that simple. Um, depleted uranium, if you look at this uh, a note here, um, uranium is an extremely dense element and depleted uranium can be put into bullets. And what we're talking about there, imagine firing bullets not with lead, but with like such ridiculously high dense material that it just goes right through armor plating. So this is a tank killing bullet, right? Tanks go by, but this stuff literally is like a hot knife through butter. Um, as dense as tank armor is, uranium tipped bullets, they're far more dense. So they'll just go right through. So yeah, armor busting, not nice. Think war. Too much text here, but originally it was perceived that instead of uranium, right, boo uranium, um, that uranium's less reactive cousin, thorium, could be used instead. So I've got a video for you today talking about the thorium reactor. The thing about thorium is that thorium doesn't go critical, not like uranium. So thorium is a bit more under control and its radioactive byproducts are in the neighborhood somewhere of about 500-ish years. So that's not a nasty fallout product that we can't deal with long term. That's much more short term, right? So thorium reactors um, are doing the same kind of thing, but in a much more sustainable way. Um, you asked the question, perhaps, why do we have uranium reactors instead of thorium reactors? Well, the weaponization process and the and the uh, producing things like plutonium, for example, um, you got to remember there was an arms race going on at the time. So the production of um, materials that could work in nuclear devices, such as nuclear weapons, was also a consideration. So thorium doesn't really produce weaponized materials like that. So thorium perhaps got a backseat because it wasn't as useful in terms of the arms race. So there's a little cloak and dagger to this as well, folks. Right? So thorium, um, for example, is quite clean, with the half-life being much less, um, and it's really not as hard to get a hold of as uranium. Remember that we've got our eyes on uranium. Uranium itself is a is a very dangerous material, especially uranium enrichment, which can lead to the production of a, a nuclear weapon. Uranium has to be the enrichment process is a whole different lecture, but the idea is um, thorium wouldn't be something we'd be worried about in the same way. So perhaps the nuclear reactors of the future should be thorium reactors. But nuclear reactors after Chernobyl, nobody really wants them in their backyard. They don't want those giant towers um, in the city either releasing steam. Um, it's just perceived um, there have been such drastic problems in history. If you ever get a chance, um, look up Three Mile Island and nuclear disaster and it'll really sort of um, put it in place for you. Movies like Silkwood um, are, are great ones to watch as well. Reenactments of that whole time. So um, there's more on the thorium cycle here but I don't want to I don't want to get too far into it but um, this is just a mention of the industrial complex and uranium weaponization, which I've already mentioned. Thorium just doesn't go down that road. So, 
it's a little bit of an issue. Um, Thorium isn't about bombs. Uh, that's probably why it didn't get the nod because you're not going to you're not going to get this when you're talking about thorium reactors. Way too much text, right? Little haha -ha moment in our slideshow here. Um, radioactivity over time. It's yeah, you get the idea. Um, radioactivity. When you look at radioactive materials, you have to sort of think about radioactive poisons. So this is Alexander uh, um, Litvinenko. I'm trying to pronounce the name right. Um, he was poisoned with a radioactive substance. Um, and it was thought that this was a uh, pretty much a, uh, a hit on his life. Uh, when you're... You've got to understand, this is called polonium-210. Now, polonium-210 has a half-life, which largely, uh, it's gone, here it is, half-life of 138 days. Now, it was believed that it was added to a tea that he had consumed. And if you're, if polonium-210, which is a, let's just say, the substance is very hard to come by. Um, this is definite cloak and dagger type stuff when it comes to war. Um, you can't get your hands on polonium-210. This stuff is um, extremely rare. And he was poisoned, they believe, with about 10 micrograms of the material. And it caused such radioactive poisoning that it killed him. But it's very hard to detect. And it has a half-life of 138 days. Well, it takes a while for the poisoning to take effect. And then... Uh, polonium turns into lead 206 as we see here the point is polonium breaks down so quick into lead 206 that it's largely gone so it's it's a it's a nasty radioactive poison it's been used to kill people and in this case it killed them in three weeks and when they went searching for well what could have done it by the time they searched there was there was virtually no polonium left they there was just enough to detect a trace of it. So when you think about a poison that you could give to your political enemies, polonium is a pretty nasty one. And in this case, used to kill political enemies. At least that's how the cloak and dagger goes. And this is what we're talking about here. It's clear, it's colorless, you wouldn't know it would be consumed and you would be suffering radiation poisoning. Um, here's the stats. One gram of polonium-210 could kill 10 million people. Okay, this isn't something you can get... Whoops! That's not something you can get your hands on very easily, folks. Right? It really isn't. Polonium-210 is, uh, is, <laughs> is a very rare material. So I'm just going to recover the file. Um, oops. Ha, if that's biology. There we go. Plutonium-210 is, is extremely hard to get your hands on. So the only way somebody could get their hands on it uh, would be if that's what it was to be used for, which is um, unfortunately believed to be the uh, political execution of an opponent. Um, right, wrong, and different. Um, that's what is believed to have happened. So, there's some pretty nasty stuff out there. Not that just it causes nuclear reactions, but can pretty much cause the worst radiation effects that could wipe you out. And this kind of stuff is kept under lock and key, ladies and gentlemen. This isn't something you just get your hands on. This is very nasty. Um, only the state would have access to things like this. It's not out in the open. 138 days, right? So about every four and a half months, you only have 50% of it left. So it breaks down very quickly in the body to the point where there's nothing left to detect, which makes it an incredibly nasty but effective poison. 
looking at fusion at work, we take we sort of take a peek at the sun here. Um, the sun, some people look up at the sky and say, look at that giant ball of burning gas in the sky. It's like, no, it's not a giant ball of burning gas. Under intense gravitational energy, hydrogen is fusing into heavier elements. And that's, that's not sustainable forever. So, um, even, even under that incredible gravitational field, you can't keep fusing things together. But it releases a ton of energy. In fact, it has made all life on the planet possible. So as we look at what's going on in the sun, it's just a giant fusion reactor. Now, if we can harness that energy, right, it's an incredible, uh, incredible source of energy, not only for plants, but we could use it to do all work on the planet. Literally, it's there. It also is a source of energy when it strikes the ground and heats up the ground and we get air currents. Um, that's where wind comes from, folks. So when you look at the advantages and disadvantages of, of like atomic energy, you look at fission, for example, and you say no greenhouse gases, and you think, wow, that'd be great. Um, but you have to look at the radioactive waste, and what are you going to do with that, and how are you going to store it, where is it going to be stored? Um, fusion, right, four and a half times the amount of energy kind of from really what you start with but geez it's it's a sort of it's a runaway train you're causing you literally nuclear fusion on the planet not out there in space like the sun how are you going to control that um it's yeah it's like i say it's a runaway train as far as disadvantages just because of the the heat that's required to cause fusion and how are you going to contain it um, it's just it's it's too much power and we don't really have a great way of controlling it at least not yet so there are lots and lots of uh, scenarios here so what I'm going to do at this point I'm just gonna quite honestly stop because there's so much material but what I wanted to give you was an overview of fission and fusion so ladies and gentlemen I hope that supplies enough for uh, section 7.3 and you have a good one, and I'll see you when I get back. Cheers.